and let me get started. All right, so like Tim, I'm gonna be talking more about uh, tiebreaker designs, um, but this time focusing on the univariate case and talking a bit more about uh, optimality. All right, so you know, I'll start with a sort of brief reminder uh, of uh, the tiebreaker setting, although it's very similar to what Tim has already described. Um, in the tiebreaker setting, you are an experimenter with two competing objectives. One is to precisely estimate the effects of some sort of treatment. And we're gonna call that exploration uh, to contrast that with the second goal of exploitation, which is to preferentially treat a certain group of people, right? So if, you're, if you have a scholarship, you both want to uh, learn the effect of that scholarship on say, students' future outcomes, uh, but you also prefer to give the scholarships to the best students to reward um, people for being good students. And throughout, we have to assume that it is ethical and possible um, to control and randomize the treatment. Otherwise, uh, the tiebreaker setting, of course, does not apply. All right, so the mathematical notation, uh, which is very similar to what Tim introduced, uh, we have N customers uh, or subjects in our experiment indexed by I. Each of these subjects has a running variable XI, uh, and the idea is that we prefer to treat individuals uh, with high values of XI. Uh, so you can think of XI as, again, a student's academic performance. Uh, we're gonna let ZI be the binary treatment indicator, so plus or minus one. And the key is that as the experimenter, we have the ability to control the treatment assignment, and we're gonna uh, make that lever of control through this function P of X, which specifies the probability of treatment, as a function of X. Um, so we're gonna call that P function a design function. And then there is a scalar outcome YI of interest that we're trying to measure um, the effect of the treatment on um, in this experiment. Uh, and as Tim described, uh, the work is under a, uh, a simple two line working regression model, essentially that amounts to fitting two linear regressions, one for the treated groups with ZI equals one, and then one for the control groups with ZI equals minus one. All right, so the three-level tiebreaker design, which was first uh, written down by Owen and Varian in 2020, um, goes like this, right? So you have this randomization window delta. If your running variable X is between minus delta and delta, then you're randomly assigned the treatment with probability one half. If you're below minus delta, then you never get the treatment. And if you're above delta, then you always get the treatment, right? And as Tim described, higher values of delta correspond to more randomization and less short-term gain, right? So the idea is that um, if you increase delta, uh, you're typically, although not always, uh, better at statistical efficiency, better at estimating your parameters. Uh, but of course, you're going to be less preferentially treating the subjects with high values of x, right? And again, delta equals zero is the RDD, and delta going to infinity will give you the RCT with treatment probably one half. Okay, so. Um, in terms of the gain criterion, right, we're gonna be using uh, the same criterion. Now we're in a univariate setting. So the gain comes down to E of X times Z, right? So that's uh, again, motivated by the expected value of Y under the two line model. But you can also just think of it as the covariance between the running variable X uh, and the treatment binary indicator Z, right? So uh, in that sense, uh, you can motivate uh, the short-term gain criterion without having to directly think about the whys as a, as a payoff. All right, so the first sort of formal result uh, is you know, something Tim alluded to in his presentation, but to write it down formally, uh, it says this, right? If you fix the fraction of subjects that you're treating, uh, so let's say um, you know, you're fixing treating 20% of the subjects or 70% of the subjects, um, no matter what fraction you, uh, you fix, it turns out that among all designs, all assignments of treatment, uh, that attain that treatment fraction, the RDD will indeed maximize the short-term gain criterion E of XC. And that, that should be fairly intuitive, right? It basically says, okay, if I can only treat 30% of my subjects, if I want to maximize gain, then I just give the treatment to the top 30% uh, of subjects. Uh, it turns out that the RCT uniquely maximizes the gain and that this is independent of the underlying distribution of the running variable X. Okay. So now that uh, we have that, um, I'll describe a, sort of one of the earlier optimality results that motivated uh, the present work. Um, so one of the sections in the uh, Owen and Varian paper um, 
considers this. So they assume that the running variable X uh, is uniform between minus one and one, or more generally has a symmetric distribution. Uh, then they say, well, okay, you assume E of Z equals zero. And because Z is plus or minus one, that corresponds to a constraint that you're giving the treatment to half of the subjects. Then they put uh, an arbitrary equality constraint on some desired level of short-term gain. So they fix E of X times Z equal to some number X Z tilde. And then what they show in that paper uh, is that the three level tiebreaker with the appropriate randomization with Delta to satisfy the short-term gain constraint will maximize uh, statistical efficiency among all possible treatment assignments. And this efficiency metric is uh, a de-optimality criterion, uh, which is uh, the, exactly what, uh, what Tim described. Um, and right, the upshot of this result is that there's no need for a sliding scale of treatment probabilities, right? Because um, if you have some any level of short-term gain that you want, right, the best way to randomize in terms of efficiency is the three-level tiebreaker. All right, so you know that that's a, that's a great result, but then uh, you know you might think some of these assumptions might be a bit restrictive, right? And so that's again what motivates uh, the present work here, right? What if e of z cannot be zero, right? Like what if you can only treat a fraction of your subjects? And also, what if the running variable x is not uniform or not symmetric, right? Um, of course, you could always rank transform the x's, but then your linear modeling is done on a different scale, and your coefficients will be less interpretable. So um, you know, we, we certainly want to be able to handle a non, non-symmetric X and arbitrary uh, treatment budgets. And so it turns out that in this setting, uh, we show that uh, you can often do a lot better uh, than the three-level tiebreaker. And we show that the optimal design uh, will have treatment probabilities that are piecewise constant in X. Um, in fact, in a sense, they will only have uh, two levels, uh, as we'll make more precise shortly. Um, and the key is that these treatment probabilities are not going to be fixed in general at 0 0.5 and 1, uh, but will be uh, two different levels. Uh, the nice part is that our characterization will work uh, for any choice of the running variable distribution f. So it's actually not a choice, right? Uh, to be more precise, it's just, you know, if we're given exogenously um, a distribution for the x's, no matter what distribution that is, as long as it has finite variance, um, it can be discrete, it can be continuous, it can be neither. Um, regardless, you know, our characterization uh, holds. And again, you can uh, fix the fraction of uh, treated subjects to be anything between zero and one. Um, and it also turns out that um, our results don't just hold for de-optimality, but actually holds for a large class of uh, efficiency measures, uh, which will be the subject of the next section. Okay, so yeah, now I will talk a bit more about efficiency. Um, and. Hopefully that'll make uh, you know the, the setup a bit more precise. Um, so we can go back uh, you know several decades right to the optimal design literature for linear models, uh, which was very popular between the 50s and the 70s. Um, so if you have a standard linear model y equals x transpose beta plus epsilon, the optimal design problem is as follows: you want to choose your covariate vectors x1 to xn to maximize some scalar function phi of uh, x transpose x. And this x is uh, the script x. It's the n by p matrix of all of your predictors. So it has rows uh, x1 through xn. Um, and the choice of scalarization, right? Um, there are many choices used in practice, as Tim discussed, right? D-optimality, where you take it to be the, deter the de determinant, is the most popular. Um, but there are also other optimality criteria, like C-optimality, A-optimality, and lots of other letters of the alphabet. Um, and so. You know, it, it'll turn out that our, our analysis can handle any of these criteria or in general, any continuous function phi of uh, this information matrix X transpose X. All right, so before we do that, uh, we'll introduce uh, what I call the relaxed optimal design problem where you replace the X transpose X uh, inside the definition uh, with an expectation of X transpose X. And now the idea is that instead of picking a discrete set of X1 through Xn, you're going to specify an entire distribution for the x's to come from, and then maximize the uh, the scalarization of your expected information matrix when your xi's are drawn from that distribution xi that you specify, right? And this is strictly more general because if you restricted xi um, to be discrete with probability masses that are integer multiples of one over n, then you're going to exactly recover um, the original optimal design problem 
But here, if you relax and allow for a broader class of distributions, uh, that makes generally that makes the math work out nicer. And so this is the setting considered by um, you know, the, the leading, uh, leading uh, statisticians who worked on this problem, um, again, between the 50s and 70s. Okay, so now let's return to our setting for the two line model and the tiebreaker. So, right, we have uh, four covariates. Um, it'll be one xi, zi, and xi times zi. So, in our setting, the relaxed optimal design problem is to choose uh, a joint distribution on xi and zi to maximize uh, some scalar function phi of the expected x transpose x. And uh, we emphasize that, right, this expectation is over the randomness um, in both x and z. But you know, this is not exactly the same problem as, uh, as, as what we discussed in the previous slides, because we cannot control the distribution of x, right? That's the running variable, and that's given to us, right? We, we cannot, as the experimenter, control the distribution of the x's. And so the only control we have is the conditional distribution of z given x. And again, we control that right through this uh, design function p of x, defined as the probability of treatment given x. Um, and so we, we essentially parameterize our problem, right, as maximizing uh, phi of the expected value of x transpose x under a design function p. So essentially, we have an optimization problem over design functions p, right, which map the real line, mapping the running variable, to the probability of treatment, which is between 0 and 1. We're going to also impose a requirement here that the design function p is non-decreasing, and that's motivated by uh, the applications that we're thinking about. Right, like in a scholarship setting, you don't want the probability of treatment to possibly decrease with X because then you're going to be incentivizing students to, to, to be worse, right? And that's certainly something that you, you wouldn't want. Of course, in some settings, you can imagine you don't want the spontaneity restriction. Um, our paper does uh, handle that case as well, um, but for today, we're going to impose that, uh, that, that restriction. Okay, so now here is sort of formally the optimization problem we're trying to solve, right? So we're choosing a design function P. Um, we have an uh, expected information matrix I, right? And that expectation depends on the choice of design function P. And our goal is to maximize efficiency, which is just phi of I for some continuous function phi, subject to three constraints, right? So the first is on E of Z, which uh, specifies what fraction of subjects we're gonna treat. The next is on E of XZ, which specifies the, uh, the short-term gain. And then the last uh, is the monotonicity constraint requiring our design function P to be non-decreasing. And we've already seen uh, from the previous results from Owen and Varian that the three-level tiebreaker solves this if the running variable distribution is symmetric, the Z tilde is zero, and we take phi to be the de uh, determinant. Um, but you know, the key is that we, we uh, here solve the general problem right, for general uh, constraints and general efficiency metrics and general uh, um, general running variable distribution. Uh, and just some terminology, we're going to say that a design function P is feasible if it satisfies those three constraints uh, on treatment fraction, short-term gain, and monotonicity. Okay, um, so I'll pause here briefly if there are any questions on this setup before going to the solution. Um, there is a question from the chat saying, is the lemma on optimality of RDD in terms of short-term gain is an application of the Mainman Pearson lemma? Yeah, it's a great question. So actually, yeah, a lot of the main results in this paper are in fact based on the Mainman Pearson lemma. That one is uh, a bit easier to prove, so you don't quite need to pull out that big of a hammer, um, but you can certainly uh, use the Mainman Pearson lemma, yes, to, to prove that, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I don't know why I went back to the previous section. Let me, uh, okay. So, all right. So now we're gonna talk about how to solve the problem. So at the top is again, the optimization problem that I presented on the previous slide. Um, and the key observation is that this expected information, expected information matrix I only depends on the design function P through three quantities. That's gonna be the E of Z, E of XZ, and E of X squared times Z. And of course, E of Z and E of XZ are already fixed by our equality constraints. So really there is only uh, one variable to optimize over, right? Um, and that's E of X squared Z. And so that suggests the following uh, solution strategy. Um, you can define this quantity X squared Z tilde dagger 
to be the value of E of X squared Z that maximizes efficiency among all values attainable by some feasible design P. And it turns out that uh, the set of attainable values of E of X squared Z is going to be a, an interval. And you can see that by noting that the set of feasible designs is closed under convex combinations. So that means that if you have two designs, P and P prime, satisfying the three constraints in our problem, you take any convex combination of them, uh, they're still going to satisfy those three constraints. And that lets you show uh, that the set of attainable E of X squared Z values um, is, in fact, a closed uh, interval. Well, it shows that it's an interval, um, that it's closed. You have to you know, argue a bit more formally, but it's not hard to see with some sequential compactness results. All right. But anyway, that's, that suggests uh, the following. Um, Solution strategy, right? So there's two steps. First, you want to solve uh, these subproblems where you maximize and minimize E of X squared Z subject to our three constraints. And that gives you uh, right two designs, P max dagger and P min dagger. If you compute E of X squared Z under those two designs, then you get the endpoints, right, of the attainable X squared Z values um, for feasible designs. And we call those, again, X squared Z min and X squared Z max. Then once you have those endpoints, right, then, then you're home free because, uh, again, your efficiency criterion, right, is just a continuous function of x squared z once you fix uh, e of z and e of x z. Um, so, you know, you can easily find uh, the, the value of uh, x squared z in that closed interval that maximizes that continuous function, right? You can sometimes do it analytically, like for de-optimality. Um, but if not, right, you can do it numerically with standard algorithms for optimizing a continuous function over a closed interval. Um, and then once you compute that optimal x squared z dagger, right, then you can take the appropriate convex combination of p max dagger and p min dagger um, to get an optimal design. OK, so now, right, the only remaining question is, how do you solve? Like, what does the solution look like for, for problem one, right? How do you, what does it look like when you maximize and minimize e of x squared z subject to these three constraints? And that's, that's the next result. Um, which, which gives a simple characterization of these results. Um, so it turns out that the solution is as follows. Uh, essentially, P max dagger and P min dagger both are two level designs. So P max dagger has one, uh, one treatment probability level at L and then another at one, while P min dagger has one at zero and then one at U. Um, and again, this characterization holds for any running variable distribution F. Um, and it turns out that these solutions are also unique um, in the sense that any two designs um, that solve the optimization problem, they have to be equal with probability one under the running variable distribution. Um, and so here's a visualization of you know, what that looks like, um, right? So on the left, you see P max dagger, right? You have an upper treatment level at one and then a lower treatment level here. Um, whereas for P min dagger, you have a lower treatment level at zero and then an upper treatment level here. And so uh, the the parameters in this plot, um, we had a uniform running variable with z tilde equal to minus 0.5. So that's treating 25% of your subjects. We fixed short-term gain at 0.3. Uh, just for reference, the RDD attains uh, 0.375. It turns out that um, in this setting, you can show that uh, the optimal convex combination is actually on the boundary, which happens quite frequently. And, and, and as a result, it, it, you can show that the optimal design uh, is in fact P max dagger. And then we actually know it's unique uh, by the uniqueness results of the, of the previous slide. Um, but yeah, basically what this Pmax dagger says is, right, um, so we're trying to treat 25% of our subjects. The RDD will say, okay, just treat the top 25%. Um, here, we always treat the top 20%, but then we give the other 80% uh, of, our, of our subjects uh, some small chance uh, to be treated. And that small chance is set so that, you know, overall, we're treating 25% of our subjects. All right, so in general, right, the optimal design as we constructed it before is a convex combination of P max dagger and P min dagger. Um, it turns out that you can simplify the optimal design further um, in the sense that as long as the X's uh, have a continuous distribution, then uh, it, you can show that in fact, there always exists a two level design that suffices. So you won't uh, any longer necessarily have a level at zero or one. Uh, you might, right, in the case where you're on the boundary, like in this example, but in general, you might not be on the boundary, and then um, you might need an arbitrary uh, two-level design with two other treatment levels. Okay, so that's the, that's it for the for the for the theory. Right now, let's look at sort of the actual some actual examples and see if uh, you know what kinds of improvements we see to uh, efficiency. 
All right, so here is the case, again, of a uniform running variable. Um, each of the four uh, panels of the plot um, have different budgets, different treatment fraction constraints. Um, you can see uh, some different designs. So the blue line is uh, the optimal monotone design that we described. The green line is the optimal design if you don't require the monotonicity constraint, which we didn't discuss today. And then the red line is the three-level tiebreaker. So in the top left, right, if you're treating half of your subjects, you, you see, as we expect, all of those designs coincide, right, because we know the three-level tiebreaker in that setting is always optimal for any short-term gain, right? Uh, and so that must also be optimal, and it's also optimal monotone because the three-level tiebreaker is a monotone design. Uh, but uh, interestingly, right, once you start treating less of your subjects, right, then you can see that clearly the three-level tiebreaker starts to do quite a bit worse uh, relative um, to the optimal designs. And I should say here that the efficiency criterion here is uh, D-optimality, um, or you can think of it, it turns out to be equivalent to the variance of beta-3 hat, and beta-3 is the difference in slopes between the treated and control groups, um, so it's nice that they, you know, that they coincide, they won't in, for a general design problem, but um, yeah, you can either think of this as D-optimality or the variance of, uh, of beta-3 hat. And uh, it's an inverse, uh, right, inverse axis. So, so you can interpret it as a variance and then, you know, so lower is better, right? Because lower is uh, lower variance and higher efficiency. Um, but yeah, you can see, right, as uh, the treatment gets uh, less and less common, right, you see a bigger drop um, in the efficiency gains going from the three-level tiebreaker to the uh, optimal monotone design, and then a smaller drop going further if you choose to re remove the monotonicity constraint. All right, so just to put some numbers on this, um, so the first two lines of this table are from the Owen and Varian paper, right? That paper showed that, okay, you can give up a bit of short-term gain in terms of E of XE to get a big uh, gain in efficiency or a big drop in variance, right? Um, but now uh, our results show that actually um, you can keep the same level of short-term gain as the three-level tiebreaker, but if you instead go to, say, uh, the appropriate two-level design, which is the optimal monotone design, then you get a, an even bigger drop um, in, the, in the variance. And then you can also get a, even more a variance reduction if you're willing to forego the monotonicity constraint. Um, yeah, but of course, you know, if you absolutely right, need the maximum short-term gain, then the RDD is unique. So of course, you can't do better without some sacrifice in short-term gain. But our results essentially tell you uh, right, the best way um, to, uh, to, to design, to assign treatment, right, given a, an equality constraint on your short-term gain. And you can see right at the right end, that's going to be the RDD because, again, it's unique. It's the unique design attaining the maximal short-term gain. Um, but as you, as you move forward, then you have more designs to choose from. And you can see, again, the three-level type breaker is not optimal. All right, so now here's the same plot, but now for, for a Weibull running variable. So now, you know, that, that this is a heavily stylized example that's extremely skewed, but just as a proof of concept. And now you can see, even if you're treating half the subjects, right, the three-level type breaker is, uh, is quite suboptimal. All right, so now, you know, again, this is just more plots. Now we just change the efficiency criterion from variance of beta-3 hat to variance of beta-2 hat. Beta-2 is uh, the difference in the intercepts between the treated and untreated groups. And uh, yeah, you see qualitatively the exact same pattern, um, right? Both for you know, uniform, for normal, and then again, for the Weibull, it's, it's uh, the same story as before. I will note one thing uh, that's interesting is that um, if you go back to D-optimality for um, which is the beta three case, you can see that the optimal monotone design, you know, is the trade-off is not monotone, right? Unlike what Tim described. And so it is monotone, right, if you're treating half of your subjects, but once you're not treating half of your subjects, it turns out that um, the RCT, which uh, is going to be at the left end with short-term gain of zero, uh, has the optimal monotone design. So you can show that the optimal monotone design with zero short-term gain is going to be the RCT. You actually do better, right, um, by getting a bit of gain. And also, um, so you, you get lower efficiency, you get higher efficiency, and also higher short-term gain by moving away from the RCT. And so this is actually a general phenomenon for the D-optimality case that we proved um, in our paper, which is, uh, I think, you know, curious and interesting result. Um, but that goes away if you're in instead trying to interpret uh, or estimate uh, beta 2 hat. You can now see that the trade-off is once again monotone. Um, so that shows that, right, of course, the optimal design will depend heavily on the efficiency criterion that you choose. Uh, but the nice thing is that this analysis works for any continuous function 
of that expected X transpose X matrix. Okay, so now just briefly uh, a quick data example, right? This is again, uh, somewhat simulated, but it has to do with Head Start, which is a 1960s US government program um, where they gave uh, 300 of the poorest counties according to some poverty index, um, some extra grant writing assistance for this program. Uh, so you can see the distribution of the poverty indexes among all counties on the left-hand side here. Um, the dashed line uh, is the cutoff. So if you're above, if your county was poorer than this cutoff, then you got the grant writing assistance. Um, so this is you know, a classic RDD example. And what the plot on the right shows is that, okay, if you were willing to randomize a little bit, then uh, you can get um, you know, some fairly large efficiency gains, right? Um, you get 30% wider CIs um, with the RDD compared to the three level tiebreaker at a short term gain of six. Um, but, you know, as we know now, right, um, it's better to use the optimal monotone design, right, uh, which has two levels, and that will be 62% uh, uh, more efficient than the RDD. Um, and, you know, I should note that, right, this is a fixed X setting, right, because, you know, here you, like Tim described, right, in, in a real setting, you're going to have running variables X1 to XN fixed. Um, and it turns out that solving this problem exactly is possible. Um, because our relaxed design problem is equivalent to the fixed X problem. If you take the expectation and take the running variable distribution to be the discrete empirical distribution of these X's. And so we can actually solve this problem exactly. And uh, we propose uh, you know, a simple linear time algorithm to compute these uh, optimal designs. Um, and you know, we have our code in our, in our paper. Okay, so that's, um, that's it for the, for the main content, right? Just to summarize, We've characterized uh, optimal tiebreaker designs, at least under a monotonicity constraint, um, whenever you have an arbitrary equality constraint on the fraction of subjects to treat and some desired level of uh, short-term gain. And again, this characterization is, works for any running variable distribution F, which is out of your control, but it doesn't matter. Um, it works for any efficiency metric that depends on the expected information matrix and any attainable equality constraints on the treatment fraction and short-term gain. Um, again, yeah, we have simple algorithms that can actually compute these designs in practice in a fixed X setting. All right, so some potential feature directions, right? So again, as Tim described, of course, this global two-line regression model is uh, you know, not going to be correct uh, in, in a real setting. Of course, it's simple and useful and provides uh, good insights, but you might want to um, be interested, right, in, okay, if, if you really can't uh, use this linear model, then what else can you do? Um, so one extension is to consider a weighted regression, right? So if you want to decrease the bias um, and you only believe in linearity in a small window of your X's, then you can downweight observations far away from some, um, some part of your, uh, your X space. And uh, so we actually have some preliminary results showing that if you use an Epineshnikov kernel, which decays quadratically um, to do a weighted regression, then uh, you can sort of uh, repeat and extend the analysis in this, uh, in this study that we talked about and show that the optimal monotone design will actually contain up to four levels, but the key is that it's, again, um, piecewise constant. Another potential area of uh, extension, right, is to get rid of the parametric assumptions altogether and think about semi-parametric estimation of things like average treatment effects um, or even heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, and so there, there's work showing that the tiebreakers can identify average treatment effects, right, unlike RDDs, that should be intuitive because you have a window of randomization. Um, but yeah, you're in a fundamentally different regime here, right, than the RDD literature, right, because if you're doing RDD, you can only identify a treatment effect at a point, and you get N to the two-fifths convergence there, right, but if you're doing average treatment effects estimation with the tiebreaker, then you get N to the one-half. Uh, of course, um, you know, you, you might want to extend the optimality setting to a multivariate running variable, as Tim described, and more generally, more complex experimental designs, such as continuous treatment variable or some types of uh, interference. All right, so that's, um, that's all um, for today. I'd like to thank Kevin Guo, Dan Kluger, and Tim Morrison um, for helpful discussions. Of course, Art as well um, for co-authoring. And again, our, we have a paper out on archive at this link. So yeah, thank you so much for, for listening and happy to take any questions. Yeah, there is a question um, from the chat. So why is the efficiency not an increasing function of E over C in the, in the plus for the, for simulations. Okay, why is the efficiency not an increasing function of E of XC? Um, slide 22, lower right-hand corner. Slide 22. I, I think you actually 
may have started addressing that later. The blue curve is yeah. not monotone. Right, yeah. So that's not an intuitive result, but that's that's just how the math works, right? I mean, if you're, if you're looking at de-optimality, right, it just turns out that the RCT is just not the best thing to do, right? Like we know the RCT is the gold standard and that's okay if you're trying to estimate like an average treatment effect, right? Then we know the RCT is, is, is best for that setting. But here, this is not average treatment effect, right? This is de-optimality or equivalently the variance of uh, beta three hat. And it just turns out that the RCT is, um, the RCT is, is worse than a design that gets a bit more gain. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is another question in the Q&A uh, asking, could, you, uh, could your approach work also for Bayesian regression designs, for example, such as Han, Murray, and Carvalho's DCF Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm not as familiar with that literature, but I'm guessing, so in like a Bayesian framework, is the idea that like I guess you have to put up some sort of prior on the on the parameters uh, or you know some sort of different often like criterion like I'm not sure what the you know what the criteria that they use there is um, but uh, you know I would suspect that maybe some of these uh, proof methods could generalize um, but I think you know getting an analytical um, characterization of these designs right is you know a bit finicky right it's a bit delicate like being able to solve this question directly. Um, at least using the methods in our paper, relies on sort of the objective and the constraints being linear in, in Z. Um, if you don't have that, then you know you have to use different and more creative approaches to, to solve the problem. Uh, now, you know, I should note you can solve these problems right numerically, right? This is actually just a linear program if you discretize, um, right? You have linear objective with two linear equality constraints. Um, so I'd imagine you could probably do something like that, but, you know, I, depending on how complex the criteria you want is, it might not be feasible to give an analytical characterization like we have here. Thanks. Um, okay, I think there's no offline questions. Yeah, I think those are all the questions. Art, do you want to add something before we wrap up? Um, well, I'm very <laughs> happy with both of the talks and honored to be their co-author. Um, I caught that um, Han Marie Carvalho. I wanted to look that up. I think I think a tiebreaker design. You know, it's we expect it to be a much better way to pick your data going forward. Um, what I don't know yet is whether it will play nicely with that analysis. Okay, great. Uh, so in that case, uh, let's wrap up. Thanks again. Thank you all. Uh, yes, so first, uh, let's thank again our speakers, uh, Tim and Harrison. Thank you for the very nice talks. And thank you, Art, for uh, contributing to the discussions and uh, the Q&A. Next week, we have Mireille Schnitzer from University of Montreal giving a talk on estimates and estimation of COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness under the test negative design, connections to causal inference. We hope to see you all there and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. That was great.